It's nice to see all of you. How are you doing today? Doing good. Today after a great Stro series win. But that kid, right, JJ? I'm, uh, I, feel, I, I feel like I'm going to destroy his last name. I'll talk about him a little bit. You're still on the Raiders. Manajevic? Manajevic? Is that a good one? I have All right, so those of you who don't know who I am, Online and in person, I'm Joe, Joe Thompson. Uh, I am a professor at U of H, also the president of the chapter here. So, you know, trying my best to fill in the shoes. Great, Bob. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bob, I'll keep doing it. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're overblowing the shoes. I know. But uh, so Chris sent me a list. Chris Chestnut kind of handles membership, and we have four new members since last month. Uh, I don't see any of them on, unless one of them's on. Mm -hmm. Fernando Badaglini, Katie, Gavin Jennings from Houston, Patrick Petty from Houston, and Brian Yoon from LA. Ryan would join us. An interesting conversation. Spy. <laughs> so, the spy, right. So anyway, um, so welcome. Um, there, there's Vince. There's our uh, trivia guy. So we got a pretty good uh, interesting program today. A lot to get through. Um, we have two, two speakers. Our main speaker here, Arlene. Uh, former member of the Hot Pants Patrol, <laughs> Philadelphia Phyllis. Um, one of her claims to fame. That is correct. <laughs> um, she has copies of her book, uh, either online, you can get it from Amazon if you want to. Uh, but here in person, they're $15. Cash, Venmo, Venmo, Zelle, whatever, PayPal. She'll take whatever. She'll, she'll even sign it. Okay, so um, you want to do that. Last month, we had a great presentation from Ted, sitting over there, enjoying his spaghetti. You know, thank you, Ted. Uh, we really enjoyed it. You know, going through your book a little bit more. Really like it. I got more in the tank. <laughs> you got more in the tank. Yeah. And I, I, I couldn't help it over here. Maybe you got stuff going on. Some presentations going on here pretty soon. Yeah, with a, with a, a star. A star. A star? Yes. Star in the room? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, if you want to hear Ted talk, hey, look them up. Your website that has all your stuff on it. Okay. All right. So uh, I wrote a couple of things here really before we get started. Um, I couldn't help. He watched the game yesterday. You couldn't help but be, uh, I guess, happy. I don't know who was the star of the game. If it was J.J. Matajevic or the young kid who caught the ball. He got a haul, didn't he? <laughs> got the uh, Justin Verlander uh, autographed jersey. I mean, I don't. How does that work? Did JV have to send a message to get the home run? Something a home run ball or hired an agent? I mean, he ended up with a big haul. I mean, some tickets and everything. So ESPN, ESPN made a big thing about the kid, the sixteen-year-old. Yeah. Okay. When the Astros representative immediately told him no. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Jersey. No Jersey. Well, she she signs all, but no Jersey. All of a sudden, word gets back and so Jersey. Social media. Social media. ESPN got involved in the negotiation. <laughs> they got back at Jersey all time. Really? Yeah. Who are you? Period. Yeah. 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 But the, the actual compliment, I mean, if I understand what happened, it was that fellow's first hit. He realized that the guy's first hit, he needs to have that ball. They went out, got the ball from the one fellow, right? That's right. Not only was it his first home run, it was his first hit. That's the compliment for the players. Someone said, I just, let me have to be a Nah. And, yeah, go ahead. I think him a little bit about the story. I mean, he, 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 he was going to throw it in a photograph back. 
So he's probably going to get an autograph that awesome. <laughs> no, and speaking of your first career hit being a home run, I just happened to be in who I am. I just tried to look this stuff up. I, I couldn't find everything. I'm sure I have an incomplete list, but I went through Astros history and I found a couple of names that you might find interesting. Their first hit was a home run. Jose Sosa surprised me. Anybody know who that is? Pitcher. Relief pitcher. <laughs> He had three career hits. One of them was a home run, his first hit. Anybody want to tell me who it was against? Bill? Uh, what, what, the other one? Uh, Jose Sosa. Who he get the home run up against? Yeah, against the Padres, July 30th, 1975. And then uh, just a couple names. Dave Batranga, second base, June 27th, 2003, against the Rangers. Charlton Jimerson, September 4th, 2006, against the Phillies. And uh, Bill had this call. Maybe he had some other calls. Mark Sakamano, the first pitch he ever saw. Wow. Right? September 8th, 2008, against the Pirates. And then I also saw it. Jordan's first hit was a home run. You know, against Baltimore, June 9th, 2019. So I, I, I just saw it. I'm sure that it's an incomplete list. And if anybody would like to do a little more research and write something up for our newsletter, right, Tony? <laughs> that comes out next month. I don't speak. I know this. I mean, just after us. After us, his I mean, this is just. Maybe it's an incomplete list. I don't know. So if anybody knows some names, I don't know. I don't know. Y'all can look something up. Though. All right, I just thought that was interesting. It was a great game. What? The last hit was home run. I, oh. It sounds like a newsletter article. That's William. That's William. So. All right. Um, now, I was talking to... Uh, I can't see. I'm getting old. Lucha and Gloria, they might be joining us in Baltimore. All right. In August. We're trying to talk them into it. There's I'm going, Bob's going, Herb's going. Anybody else plan on going to Baltimore? Yo. Yo. Yeah. Maxwell. Maxwell, you gotta go. You can have a presentation. <laughs> You've already seen it, Bob. <laughs> I know. So uh I'll be there for his presentation. Um Early registration ends on the 20th of July. Um, the hotel, they're running out of rooms, but it's $199 a night. It's pretty cheap compared to a lot of the other good places in town. That's all I'm going to say. Um, as part of that, you can get, you can uh, sign up for, get a historic ballpark bus tour. It's about 15 bucks or something like that. Um, if you get the all-inclusive package, it's it, it's great. So uh, you have to be vaccinated, but it just you know, as you know, you got to upload your card. But please sign up. You know, I'd like to see some of y'all there. Um, something else, Marsha, who is on the line with us, she wants to really enjoy the meetings. She kind of wants to step back a little bit. So I'm looking for a recording secretary, and. Uh, I, I do a lot of the level. I, I write up a lot of the summaries already. And, you know, if we just have somebody to take a few notes, you know, that's all we really need. So, somebody want to take over for Marsha, please let me know. You know, um, next couple of months. Mike McCroskey is not here. He decided to go to Costa Rica. Oh, for some reason. <laughs> um, Mike is trying to set up a new. Uh, another uh, Space Cowboys game. Um, he's either, he, he wants to do it in August. So it'll be before we leave. If you want to see the Round Rock Express again, or if, would anybody be interested in seeing the Albuquerque team the first week of September? I know this Labor Day we do. That'd be a problem. Well, the Albuquerque guys and toes. No, no, in, in sure. Oh, would anybody interested? Yeah, no, would anybody interested in seeing them? 
I'm trying. Uh, yeah, yeah. We can see the the Round Rock Express the first weekend of August. We can't set it up for the middle of August because we're going to be in Baltimore. In the end of August, they're playing Albuquerque at Sugarland. So, you know. You know, Rob Manfred made a comment today about they want to put the robo umpires in AAA very quickly, like maybe uh, next month. Mm -hmm. I don't have the date, but we're, it was supposed to start in May. But now that they're thinking about it, it will be a uh, uh, short. And one of our members is going to Round Rock, uh, excuse me, race. Space Calvary. Space Square. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's going on Friday, so maybe he gets some update on that. Yeah, all the strikes. They still call all the strikes. Yeah. What does that actually call it? All the strikes. Near on the right. It's false. That's right. Yeah. So, right. yeah. so uh, look for some details. Uh, Mike and I will set this up and. You know, um, I assume it would probably be about fifty-five dollars a ticket. You can sit in the air conditioning again, buffet kind of stuff. Maybe the food will be a little different. But, but uh, anyway, it was all right. Um, on Wednesday, May the twenty-fifth, there was a uh, chapter leaders meeting. You know, with Saber. Okay, and they talked about some things that all the chapters could do to get more engagement and get more membership. You know. Um, it, Whatever we can do to, you know, get the get Saber out there, get more people involved and that kind of stuff. And uh, they talked about some groups are doing chapter events, get involved with schools. You know, we do a lot of stuff with the website, social media, try to get more and more people involved. I can't do everything I try to. And I, 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 I that's just my fault, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but one of, uh, one of the presentations I thought was very interesting. And um, something that I think this group would really like to do, and Bob has already expressed interest, John Racanelli from the Sabre Landmarks Committee um, is putting together a Sabre map that has all the ballparks in the country, all the base, all the historic baseball parks. Um, and they're having a, an event a, uh, uh, on July the 5th or something. Six. July the 6th, Wednesday, July the 6th. And here in Houston, we have a history of parks, you know? So uh, all they ask you to do with this committee is if you've been to the park or what is it, Bob? They take a picture and upload something and they're trying to use Google Maps or something like that and have a really good, really extensive map of all the parks in the country. And uh, if you, uh, I have this uh, website here and um, when I send it out, if you click on it, you see how extensive and how many parks there are, you know, on most like baseball parks, okay, major leagues, minor leagues, but they don't think about all the other parks, Negro League parks, uh, parks that are no longer around. I mean, here in Houston, we had an event with the West End Park over there. Uh, I'm not sure if that's on the map, or but they talked about ways where we could add parks, and I'm sure here in the city, I don't even know the bus stadiums on it. Is it? I have checked the map now. Yeah, we have eight parks here in Houston that were professional. You played professional play and play mm -hmm. uh, going way back. Right. So it's just a way where you know chapters can get involved and members can get involved and you know um, do some research and add to the growing list of parks. This guy knows. Many of them are. Yeah. And it's just not <laughs> there you go. Or, and there you go. Know where you grew up. Yeah, and yeah, Mississippi, any, any place you have to come to Walmart, first you got to get it listed. Right. And then hopefully write up a little about it and then maybe take a picture eventually. <laughs> yeah, they, they have a landmark committee. Uh, and as a member of Sabre, you can join the evening committee and uh, you can join this committee. So, you know, if you want more information, uh, I, I can give it to you. Uh, I've made some minor changes to the uh, chapter website. Uh, if you go on the chapter website, the first thing you see is a picture of Arlene. She's our presenter today. <laughs> but you also see uh, something I try and bought up. Bill, as, as you know, those of you who've been reading the, uh, the newsletters, he's written a couple of articles about life cow, basically. Um, and uh, the first complete 
uh, article, which was a little too long for the newsletter. I, I published completely. It's on there. You can click on it, read it. Um, what I thought about doing is starting a blog on the chapter website. If you just want to write something, you know, just whatever, you know, I, I could throw it on there. You know, it, it's just another way where you can get involved with the chat. Or something like this. Just a couple of minor tweaks. And if you haven't had a chance to go look at the website, I mean, feel free to do so. There's a lot of good stuff on there. So I, I'm trying to add to it all the time. Um, our next newsletter will come out next month. You know, uh, in July, the All-Star Game Edition, as I like to call it, the Summer Edition. Um, Tony... Our editor has talked about things that happened in 1922. You can anybody can you know how it how it relates to Houston. Anybody can write. We're always looking for articles. Bill Brown has another article coming out. Uh, I'm thinking about writing something about the All Star Game. You know, so if you want to write something, even if you don't think it's important, even if you don't think people are want to read it, I, I, I highly recommend you just give it give it a shot. Yeah, that's 600 words, 800 words, what? Send us an idea. You, you, you can't pay great rates. Yeah, <laughs> great rates. You know, all the free copies you want. So just feel free if you want to write about something. We're always looking for new new writers. Arlene, you want to write something? Ted, you want to write something? Uh, Ira, you want to write something? Uh, you know, Maxwell, David, got something with his, his book coming out. So send something in by July 15th. Please. And if we don't use it this time, we'll use it for the fall. So it's just a good way to write stuff and uh, have more engagement. All right. That's all I'm going to say. Um, I'm going to introduce our featured guest, Arlene Lassen. She earned her master's degree in educational psychology. She's worked in different diverse positions throughout the years, including promotions for the Philadelphia Phillies. An investigator for a federal agency. So watch out, everybody. Okay. <laughs> and in industrial psychology. Completed a postmaster's program from the Jesse Jones Graduate School of Business at Rice. Wow. Uh, in entrepreneurship back in 2012. <laughs> she moved to Houston the year after the Philly. Sorry, Brad. She got out of town. <laughs> <laughs> she moved here. Um, and she's, you got an offer from a small newspaper to write features, kind of launched your writing career. This has resulted in her being published all over the place, internationally, nationally, regionally, locally, newspapers, magazines, some of her writing. No, wait, you have a thousand articles in the Houston Chronicle over the years. Are you more published than John McClain? <laughs> um, You've written a lot of the Huffington Post. Uh, you can Google all of our articles. Uh, just look up Arlene Nissen Lassen. Um, she has been published in many different languages. She's frequently quoted and cited in both national and international publications, including Cosmopolitan Magazine. All right, Cosmo. So my wife knows a lot about that. So uh, her articles are everywhere also frequently penned on Pinterest. So we are very honored to have Arlene here. Uh, she's going to talk about her time with the Phillies and her love of baseball. So Arlene. Larger. I brought it. That's what I used to wear. Doesn't fit. That's a loss. Um, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I just published my first book because simultaneous to my writing and journalism career. Oh, and first of all, I want to thank Maxwell, wherever you are, Maxwell, for introducing right, me. Right behind you. Behind you. Having me <laughs> to speak to you. And I'm a baseball fan, so I belong among you. Um, and I've been a lifelong baseball fan, and that's how I got this Phillies job. And I still love baseball, and I've kind of switched to the Astros, but I still follow them. Yeah. 
But at any rate, um, my book, which is what I'm promoting, and I'm going to a lot of professional groups, is a compilation of my blog efforts, and they are essays on everything in life. So there's everything in there, but she's saying uh, any topic that you can think about, nostalgia, current trends, anything and everything. Um, someone was telling me they were reading my blog recently, and it's about my 95-year-old aging dad, who I will mention in my talk. Um, I am dealing with some issues with him right now, but he's the reason that I got into baseball. I was a daddy's girl, and he was the biggest baseball fan ever, and still at 95 with a little bit of dementia, it's still the biggest fan. And he also has switched to the Astros since he's lived in Houston, which is amazing because he was born in 1927 and he was bred on the Phillies and he's an Astros fan. I mean, how can you not love the Astros? It's a great baseball town and a great team. So uh, again, if you're interested in my book, I really feel like it's for men, it's for women. There's a little of something uh, for everybody in it. And the hot flashes, I know it's mistitled, but my editor at the Chronicle, when I first started this blog, thought it was very clever because I was middle-aged and it was the hot topics that came out of my brain. So I said, I know, I'll call it hot flashes. And they were my hot flashes of inspiration, whatever I was thinking about. But a lot of people get confused when they hear the title and they thought, I don't want to buy a book about menopause. <laughs> it kind of hurt me a little bit when I was being so clever. There's a lot of humor in the book. There's a lot of lamp out math stuff. So um, I just was trying to be clever, but it is for everybody. So that's my little plug on my book. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my background, which Joe did a fantastic job. I probably can't beat what Joe said, but um, when the Huffington Post picked up my blog, which some of these uh, blogs were picked up by the Huffington Post, uh, I had readers in the millions. And all of a sudden I saw my byline in German and in, in Japanese and Korean and went all over the world and received mail from people all around the world. And one in particular that went viral um, was quoted as being the expert piece, even though it was just my opinion. It wasn't factual. It was just my experience. And it was picked up by all these South, Af uh, South American news outlets. And uh, I've been quoted as the expert on first love because I wrote something about first love that was picked up by the Huffington Post and went viral all over the world, published in many languages. And my Go the Google search was number one for a while on first love. And so I still get mail today. I'm considered an expert on it because I had a first love that I wrote. At any rate, that's how viral things happen, and it's really a thrill, except for the fact that if you read my book, you'll see that sometimes you can get very viral and sick from things going viral because people plagiarize or they steal and they pick up your stuff and they use their own byline, and it really makes you sick if you're a writer. So there's uh, an interesting little feature in there. Um, the Reviews on Amazon are really fantastic. People are so generous with their comments. Uh, they say there's a little uh, something for everyone. Memories that you may have forgotten, like when the man men first landed on the moon. If you'd like to remember that day and where you were, you can read my little story about it. And I love writing about things like that because I have one of those kind of memories where... Um, I just remember everything long-term and nothing short-term. So when I walk into a room, I completely forget why I'm there or what I meant to get. But my long-term memory is cracking. Don't forget a thing. So at any rate, I think you'll enjoy the book and I'm here to promote it, but I'm also here to talk about my experience with Philadelphia Phillies. And um, I'm glad that we started off, Joe started off with that story about the Verlander jersey because I came up in an era where 
Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of public relations and fan appreciation, and there wasn't a whole lot of promotional stuff to bring fans into the ballpark. You either were a baseball fan and you wanted to go to the game, or you weren't. And uh, there weren't a lot of creative, clever marketing people trying to figure out how to get people into the ball game. So I came up in the 70s where the Philadelphia Phillies were moving into a new stadium. <laughs> Veteran Stadium. And uh, this was in 1972. And it was a beautiful new stadium. And they were trying to figure out how to fill the seat. So the general manager and the management talked about it. And it was mostly men coming to baseball games then. It was before the era of women and children, you know, attending a lot of games. Of course, kids went with their dads. But at any rate, it was mostly men, mostly white men, mostly professional men. So they wanted to figure out a way to get people into the ballpark. And so they came up with the hot pants control. And these were, uh, we were originally called Phillies. These were the first Phillies. The uniform, um, I did wear that awful high necked nun type of uniform when I first started. Then they switched to a V neck model, uh, but it was hot. It's hot. There was there was no air conditioning. It was wasn't a closed stadium. And if you think that Philadelphia is a cool climate, you're wrong. It's hot and humid all summer long, right? <laughs> yes, yes. So we had to wear high white boots with stockings. That was a rule, and uh, a jacket and a turtleneck and that almost strangled us. So it wasn't the most comfortable outfit, but the men sure like. <laughs> uh, so this is me at my, um, right after my 1976 audition. I was quite young. Uh, I was a college student, and I was looking for a part-time job, and I loved baseball, and I knew about the Hot Pants Patrol, and the Phillies were a really hot team with budding superstars. So I went and I auditioned. And when I say auditioned, you don't do a song and dance, but you had some very, very difficult interviews to get through. So first there was a panel interview and they kind of asked you a little bit about your history with baseball and the Phillies. And they were trying to, kind of, I think, sort out, are you a groupie? Or do you really want to do this? It's a long baseball season. We want committed people. So my first interview was with the panel. Uh, when I passed that, I went to the marketing people who interviewed me. And my third round was with the general manager, who was Bill Giles. And uh, if Bill Giles gave you the thumbs up, you were in. And so the bicentennial year in Philadelphia, 1976, which was a big deal in Philadelphia, um, that was my first season as a Phillies girl. We called it Phillies girl, also called the Hot Pants Patrol. We were no longer called the Phillies. Right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, I wanna just talk a little bit about, uh, again, PR and getting fans in the seats and doing customer service. The era that I was in was one where baseball autographs were mostly free and players kind of allowed kids to congregate after the, at the stadium after the game and get their free autographs. And it wasn't big business then. It wasn't big business. So it wasn't really the advice of clever marketing people. There were very few giveaways. Um, so... The idea was to start having fan entertainment. And um, the fan entertainment, which I'll go into a little bit more, was uh, ball girls and fillies, uh, hot pants patrol girls who 
have, would pose with anyone to have their picture taken and just interact with fans and just get a nice professional public image. And also, I'll tell you later about some more things that we did a, on a promotional level. Um, when I interviewed for the Phillies, they made it very clear that they wanted nice girls. They wanted to uh, have a very squeaky clean public image of the Phillies. Um, so you had to be squeaky clean in appearance. You had to be very um, on time. And we had to come two hours before the game. So it was a long time, especially on a double header <laughs> or a rain delay. You had to be really committed to, to do this job. It's not an easy job. Um, Barracuda was what we nicknamed our supervisor um, because she, she was like um, your den mother from hell. <laughs> she would inspect your uniform to make sure it was clean and wasn't sweaty and under the arm. I mean, she checked everything. She checked your hair. She checked your makeup. She checked to see if you had stockings on uh, because we had to wear nylons underneath our uniform. Uh, you could not be bare-legged at all. So we called her Barracuda. But I figured out early on that Barracuda was a mom of two kids. And I, um, in my clever way, decided that I would start asking her to see pictures of her children and discussing her children. And so she gave me some primo spots because she was the one who scheduled where we were going to be. So that was the best move I made was getting into the Barracuda. Um, I got to meet Chris Wheeler, and a lot of you would not know the name Chris Wheeler. You know the name Chris Wheeler. Um, he was in charge of promotions, and he was also the radio uh, broadcast person, and he was a fantastic guy. Um, he was a great boss to work for, and he was not my boss initially. Barracuda was my only boss. But when I moved into promotions, Chris Wheeler was my boss. And I have to tell you a little story about Chris Wheeler. Um, he's a really great guy, and he's still around. And when I moved to Houston, uh, I had worked for the Phillies for a number of years, got through the World Series with them before I moved to Houston. And then I moved and was at Astros games. And so at one of the Astros games that I went to, I knew my dad would be listening on radio back in Philly because my dad, although he, he grew up on um, radio, baseball and radio. So he preferred to listen to a baseball game on radio, even when they were televised. So this was just how he grew up. It was exciting to him to hear the crack of the bat over the radio. So he was a big fan of this wheeler. So. One of the Astros games, I got word to Chris Wheeler, and I don't even remember how I did it. I contacted the office, and I told him I used to work for him, and could I please say hello to him? And he invited me up to the broadcast booth in the Astrodome, and um, he then was going on and on on the radio about, this is Arlene, and she used to work for me, and she was the most beautiful uh, Phillies girl that ever was, and a real big baseball fan, although she went and moved to Houston or something like that. And my dad was listening and he called me later that evening after the game. And I never heard such excitement. And <laughs> I mean, he knew I worked for the Phillies. He adored the fact that I worked for the Phillies and I got him into games. But this was a highlight of his life to be announced over the radio which was his preferred way of listening to baseball. So Chris Miller was great. <laughs> um, we were not allowed to have cameras while we were working. And let me tell you, there was a lot of exciting moments that I missed not having a camera, but one of the hard and fast rules, and especially when I moved into promotions, was you may not bring a camera and take pictures with superstars. You just, you couldn't do it. So. When I think of my archives, it would have been a lot better and much more extensive had we been allowed, but it was a, a, a just a hard cast rule that we weren't allowed to take pictures 
while we were working. Okay, next. <laughs> so in 1978, they decided to do even more to bring fans in and to entertain the fans. So they brought in the Philly Fanatic, and this is me in the paper with the Philly Fanatic. I have to give a lot of credit to Dave Raymond, who was the original Philly fanatic. First of all, he had the best personality for a mascot. Um, he just thought of such creative and clever things. He had everybody in stitches every single game. He figured out how to tease the ground crews. He figured out how to tease the umpires um, and the San Diego chicken had just started and made a big name for himself. But this guy, Dave Raymond, really put the Philly Fanatic on the map. And he just was such a fun guy to work with. And he liked me. In fact, he asked me out several times. He liked me. So whenever he saw me, as in this time, he would attack me. Either with a tongue or, you know do one of his fair hugs or whatever. And I got on the big screen an awful lot thanks to Dave Raymond. <laughs> and that's how Chris Wheeler found me. And that's how I got discovered. So thank you, Dave Raymond, uh, for discovering me first. And that's how I ended up moving up the line in the Phillies organization. Okay. Uh, so, as we all know, baseball season is very long, and um, Dave Raymond had a great idea about interacting with Hot Pants Girls. Uh, people love to come and take our photos and talk to us and pose with us for photos, which we always oblige, but he figured out that he could really get some good yes by doing different things with us. And... Um, he was very, very funny and at our expense, but um, he, he created a lot of fan entertainment. And all of a sudden, more and more people were coming to the stadium. They wanted to be there for all this fun and excitement. So it was a very, very smart move on the Phillies' part. And that was 1978. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this is a great story. This is on my blog, but not in my book, unfortunately. So I'm going to tell you about it. I, um, I, I can't remember where this guy found my blog on being a member of the Phillies Hot Pants Patrol. But some doctor, physician from Philadelphia uh, read my blog and he wrote me a letter. And I, I hear from readers all the time, so that was not unusual. But he said... I think I took your picture because I was an amateur photographer as a kid and I went around and I took a lot of pictures of Billy's girls and I think I have your picture. So if you would like me to send it to you, uh, give me your address and I will be glad to send it to you. So this was the photo he had taken of me and I had never seen this photo of myself, but here like, you know, 40 years later, to get a photo of yourself like that is really a thrill, you know, in your prime and just taken by a stranger. Um, and he we're, sent it to me. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Same one. <laughs> Same one. Um, yeah. And as you can see, that's like a size two. <laughs> so, but at any rate, <laughs> maybe a size one. But at any rate, um, that was really a thrill. And uh, there are thousands of photos around uh, different fans of the Phillies through the years with me in them. But this one reached out and sent it to me. So I thought that was really a special story. Okay. okay uh, when I went on the big scoreboard, I was discovered by... Um, photographers at a local newspaper who came and took close-ups of my face. I hate that photo, but at any rate, a modeling agency came calling and other various opportunities came around. So um, really, 
working for the Phillies was a very lucrative, nice thing. Now, I have to say that I was very academic and very ambitious with my college career, but I was also working my way through. So all of these jobs really helped me work my way through college. And um, all of these opportunities I'm very grateful for because instead of my claim to fame being my legs, which I was called legs for a while, um, it was, and it ended up being my writing that was my claim to fame. So I have to credit all of these opportunities I was given um, that allowed me to finish my education and get my master's degree and have great careers. Uh, that gives you a little idea of what I look like. Uh, that was taken by a friend, but um, Chris Wheeler met me after I had been on the big screen several times and said, you have to be on the promotions team. I just have to have you on the promotions team. And I said, great, what's that? So he talked money, which is important. And he talked about um, hobnobbing with players. And I thought, great, because being a Phillies girl and on the Hot Pants Patrol, there was this unwritten rule where if players, if you were on the field boxes, which I was most of the time, um, if players saw you and they were attracted to you, they would um, go like this. And they'd want you to write your phone number down so they could call you and take you out later. And um, vice versa, they would sometimes send you a note. They would get like one of the bat boys or something to send you a note and come and hunt you down. And so um, there was a lot of opportunity if you wanted to be a bad girl, but I never took any of those up. And um, I did want to be on the promotions team because I never took those up, but I wanted to get to know the players. There were a lot of superstars on the team, tons of superstars. And I really wanted to get to know them because I was a baseball fan. Okay. That's another close-up of what I look like in my youth. <laughs> Beauty is fleeting. <laughs> okay. Uh, 1979, we were infamous in 1979. Um, the Playboys ran an article about the Hot Pants Patroller. And I tried to find it um, in an archive. It, it was, I think, 1979. But the local media just took the story and just just made us notorious because the Playboy um, featured because we were wearing hot pants and we were a bunch of attractive girls. Um, they kind of implied that we were groupies and we were meeting players behind the dugouts and in the tunnels. And it was a pretty ugly article and so not true. I mean, so not true. If a girl got caught doing anything like that with a player, they were canned. So we had to be very careful about what we did and who we did it with. But Playboy enjoyed the story, um, and they had to write a retraction because the Phillies threatened to sue them, and it was untrue, and they did write a retraction. But the local media really took advantage of it, and... The Phillies girls on Hot Pants Patrol was hotter than ever in 1979. So we were talking about a lot. 1980 was a great year. We went to the World Series and we won it. And I was down on the field. It was freezing cold. So I was wearing my Phillies issue jacket and our long uniform. No hot pants during the World Series. But um, it was really an exciting event to be down on the field level, right there in the action when Tug McGraw jumped up in the air. And I was right there, right in front of him practically. So that was awesome. Okay, next. I did lots of promotions with big names. Does everybody recognize him? Anybody know who he is? Yes. You heard me say Good guesses? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Keith was upset with me. He asked me out. Oh, Keith, her name. Keith was upset with me. 
So that's the picture I got in my <laughs> um, This happened to have been taken at one of the events where we were allowed to bring cameras because we weren't officially working and we didn't have our uniforms on, we had regular clothing. We were allowed to go to promotions where we weren't officially working just to be kind of eye candy. And this was one of those, it was a bowling thing. He was sitting up in a bowling chair and he was mad at me at the time. So that's the picture I got of Pete Hernandez. Next. Uh, some of the promotions I did were boring like going to the um, paper, the bulletin, and handing out little supplements or Phillies pictures, team pictures, or things like that. Lots of bank openings. Wasn't always a lot of fun. Some of it was, you know, just a job. But I was very appreciative for everything that I did. Anybody know who that is? Okay. Yes. Yeah, um, I got to meet some very big names, and that was the exciting part of my job. Was she standing on a box, or is he really that tall? Hmm? Standing on a box, or is he really that tall? He's wearing a Gary Maddox. Like, you know what? That's it. He was a really nice guy. He was a really nice guy. I think he was in two or three promotions with the Phillies, and um, he was just a really great guy. Uh, Sparky Lyle, really, really nice guy, very nice guy. Um, this was one of the promotions where we were not uniform, so we were allowed to bring cameras and take pictures. So I was just going around getting as many photos as I could because when I had the rare opportunity, I took advantage of it. I was a fan first, um, a hot pants patrol member second. Uh, so the Phillies were really, really hot when I worked for them. Uh, from 76 to 80 is when I worked for them. 76, they clinched the division, uh, but lost the pennant. 77, they clinched the division, but lost the pennant. 78, they clinched the division and lost the pennant. We, I, I thought I'd never get to the World Series, let alone yeah, get to win it. <laughs> 79 was a really off year. I don't know why they had a great team, but just an off year. We didn't get to the playoffs at all. In 1980, we came roaring back, clinched the division, won the league championship, and then the World Series. So that was such an exciting year. Broke our hearts, you know. Yeah, we went, yeah, we went there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, some superstar players were notorious. I don't know if you remember the bull, Greg Rosinski, power hitter. Um, not such a great guy, as you can see from his expression. <laughs> he worked with me several times. He knew who I was, but he was never the kind that would chit chat or talk um i guess just wasn't that that part of his personality but at any rate that's the bull and i know he was hated by other teams <laughs> um in order to get to the world series we had to get rid of danny ozark <laughs> and get dallas green so here is Della, a picture of dallas green and he did what we needed to have it happen howard eskin yes exactly howard eskin's sister worked with us oh yeah <laughs> Joanne Austin. Yeah. Good job. Boy, it's nice having a Phillies fan here. This is Richie Ashburn. Yeah. Um, he was one of the most beloved longtime um, team, team members of the Phillies and then an announcer and just very beloved. So it was a thrill to get to take a picture with him. We worked several promotions together, but this particular one, again, I have my camera and I got a photo. <clears throat> this was one of my favorite players to work with. This is Warren Brewster. Warren Brewster was a pitcher, and he was the kind of guy who didn't think he was above anybody yeah. else. And he wasn't a superstar, so he was just a regular guy. And when he friended you, he remembered you from time to time. You didn't have to reintroduce yourself. He never put on any airs. And it was really refreshing because a lot of these guys 
for different. <laughs> so he's one of my favorites. Uh, there's another one of my favorite. You can see in his smile what kind of guy he was. Just a genuine, warm, nice guy. Type of law. Um, just a really, really great guy. Uh, not necessarily on the make, just friendly. I mean, you know, he had his share of shenanigans, of course, but um, just really a great guy to work with. I really loved working with him. Mike Schmidt was one of my favorites. Mike Schmidt was a teaser. He liked to play jokes on you. He liked to tease you. He liked to introduce you to his superstar friends, which is how I met Keith Hernandez. He was unbelievable. And I worked many promotions with Mike Schmidt. And he was a many-time MVP, um, a real superstar, but very down to earth. And in my book, like Steve Carlton was a superstar, but he was above everybody. Mike Schmidt, not like that. Just a regular guy, just a great guy. And there is Tim McCarver, another guy. And this was a different promotion and um, a really, really great guy. He was a fun guy to work with, Tim McCarver. I mean, yeah. And so there I summarized. <laughs> Tom McGraw was just a funny guy, just hilarious and warm and just so much fun. Uh, Mike Schmidt. Mike Schmidt was really unusual because he um, he tried to pick up the pretty girls. I mean, just like they all did. But if you told him no, he was very respectful afterwards. <clears throat> it was like he understood. That's right. I can accept that. Whereas I have a story in my book about another guy <laughs> who was a teammate, and you have to read it in my book, and you also have to read the Keith Hernandez story in my book, because I'm not going to tell you about that, because I'm not going to slander it. But you're not know about that. At least not. Uh, just um, you have not mentioned Pete Rose. Oh, Pete Rose. <laughs> <laughs> I avoided him. <laughs> We did not like Peter Snell. No. Um, I, did, I did have to work a lot of promotions, but he was the kind that he would kind of scurry into the promotion and leave as soon as he could. He wasn't really in it, even at charity events. He wasn't in it with his heart like some of the other players. So, oh, sorry, Bo. Larry Bell was awful. <laughs> Oh, I hated him. <laughs> but in any rate, uh, Larry Bella had a mistress and a wife. And he had a home for his mistress and a home for his wife. Oh, I could tell you all kinds of things. <laughs> but didn't like Larry Bella. Not a good guy at all. One of the controversial players on the team is Dick Allen. Yes, correct. Correct. Dick Allen. Also, not a very nice guy. How about Joe Moore? Who? Joe Morgan. Nice guy. Very nice. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So at any rate, there was a superstar player. He was um, very good at his position, very handsome, very married family man with a beautiful family. And uh, he did not want to take no for an answer. And he reported me to my boss, Chris. Um, be, for being nasty to him because I said no. Right. So it was the era where you kept your mouth shut if there was sexual harassment, you did not want to lose your job. But I told Chris Wheeler what he tried to do and Chris completely defended me 100%. Uh, and I just avoided him from then on. Uh, he shall not be named, but you may be able to figure it out if you read the story. Okay. That that story, I read that story in the book. That's the cost of the book. <laughs> it's a great story. Yeah, there's some <laughs> and there are some baseball stories. Um, my whole time coming up with the Phillies that I just summarized, but also 
a war story and a sexual harassment story. So, yeah. Did you get a World Series ring or a penguin? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a great question. I'm going to open up. Um, if you go to the Wikipedia and you pull up Hot Pants Patrol, guess who's claimed to fame? <laughs> guess who's shirt as the Hot Pants for none other than me. I don't know how it happened, but there I am. <laughs> So I am the poster girl of the era. The Hot Pants Patrol disbanded in 1982. It just had gone its course, started in 72, and just ran its course. It wasn't a big thing anymore, and uh, they disbanded it. But I moved to Houston in 1981, so it didn't matter to me. And uh, when I moved to Houston, I kind of brought my uniform with me because I wanted to remember those days. So I don't think I got my last paycheck, but something like that. <laughs> um, so about the World Series, uh, they invited us to be part of the parade. So that was really exciting, being on the float with our uniforms, and especially the promotions team had a lot of stuff the year of the World Series. The Phillies were invited to everything and anything, and the select promotions girls were invited to a lot of things. So. I got a lot of fun um, bonuses from being with the World Series team, but not a single thing other than a little pee pin. And it said World Series. That was it. No ring, nothing. Um, I, the Astros owner is very generous, but the Phillies owner at that time, there was nothing for even the front office. Um, they got very little after the World Series. Too. Yeah. So that was a great question. So yeah, I bought my beer from last night. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. They changed. I mean, I think that's yeah. the way to yeah. do it. Because I, mean, because I think behind yeah. the scenes, people are just as much, well, not, not just as much, but I think behind the scenes, people are very important to the success of the team. And I totally agree with that philosophy. So, so did you meet the Phillies owner? I mean, who was he? Did he just seem to be that way at the time? Who was the Phillies owner? Uh, Campbell. Campbell. Yeah. Carpenter. 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 I'm sorry. Carpenter. Yeah. Carpenter. Yeah. Okay. Real quick. My brother works part time at the Astros. Uh huh. She sells what they call it. Sherry, here are tickets for the Astros Foundation. She got a World Series. She got an American League pennant for last year's pennant. Very and, generous. And during COVID, when all the stadiums were shut down <laughs> and nobody was getting paid, the Astros sent her a check. Wow. Yeah. 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 No, the Astros are a first class team. That's why I kind of um and now an Astros fan. I mean, when I first got to Houston, I told I told you this, it was culture shock for me because I went to the Astrodome, which was an indoor stadium, and I'm like baseball in an indoor stadium that this is impossible so i had to get used to that and then i had to get used to the fact that they did absolutely nothing for fan entertainment i was used to um a wild and crazy mascot doing all sorts of things with the unpopular yeah yeah just they weren't in fan entertainment it was Kind of boring. It was a long game, some of those games. But for some reason, I thought the Astros had heart, and I did adopt them eventually. And yeah, that was interesting coming. Were you on duty that day? The fanatic found the sword and got a big fight? Yes. Yes. Remember that? Right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. The, the fanatic was in the newspaper, possibly. More than um, the Phillies players. I mean, there were a, a lot of things. He was really uh, the umpires. Certain umpires were going to create new rules because of things that he did that bothered them. I mean, he really pushed the limit. <laughs> he really, he really did push the limit. Um, and it was all in the name of fan entertainment. That's why when I came to Houston, it was like. 
it was a whole different game for me because I was used to, and believe me, going to all through a whole home series um, baseball season, 1976, 1977, 78, 79, 80. Those are long seasons. So if there weren't a lot of reasons to keep us working year after year, because even if you're the biggest baseball fan and you're a season ticket holder, it can get old. <laughs> and especially if you're on duty two hours before and you have to wait through rain delays and everything like that. But the Phillies really did a great job in keeping the fans in their seats and coming up. And the war stories are in the book. I did not specifically talk about them because they have to be read to be appreciated. Plus, I don't like to slander people in person. But um, you can read some of my war stories in the book. Um, it was such an important time in my life. And uh, it was not just because I was working for a hot baseball team, but because it was just a, a different era. And it was it was an era where the feminist movement was starting, but yet women were still be, being used as eye candy. You know, it was like a, just a different era. Yeah. It's a different era. Not happening that much. Now. I mean, now it's flight attendants, males and females. You know, you remember those old days where the flight attendants had to wear the hot pants and the fancy outfits. They were called stewardesses. But yeah, women were definitely objectified back in the day. I never felt that way, though. The Phillies organization, as I said, wanted squeaky clean girls, and I never felt objectified. Even um, if a fan kind of tried to push the envelope with me, um, you just were very polite, smiled, and walked to one of the supervisors that were stationed along the, um, there were usher supervisors, and you just walked, if there was a problem, and reported it, and they would take care of the patron very quick. And uh, just a lot of posting photos and things like that. But I never felt dirty or objectified or like, you know, used in any way. So they were first in this organization. And that's it. Thank you for inviting I know you talk a lot about the Phillies players, but did you have a favorite player that you wanted that picture with from outside the Phillies organization that you had a chance to meet during this time? Did you meet? Um, it that I wanted a photo with. Did you? Um, did y'all have to? You no, know, I don't. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, really, there were a couple of very big promotional opportunities where there were like full weekend events for the Phillies. Um, for charity and players would come in from all over. It was just, they knew they would have a great time. They knew they would probably meet women. <laughs> they knew that, you know, the food would be really good and they would be treated really well and they would be helping charity causes. So um, there were a lot of superstars that came and I met a lot of big name players, but um you have to read the book to find out about Keith Hernandez because he was a co-MVP and he was one of the bigger names in that era. And he had a little drug issue, <laughs> little drug issue. Several of the players on the Phillies, I didn't talk about that, but several of the players on the Phillies had the same little drug issue. Uh, there was no testing back in the day and uh, they could stay up all night at these promotions. And I could never, I was so naive. I mean, I was not into drugs at all. And I could not figure out why they could stay up all night. And I was like exhausted. <laughs> but later on, I figured it out, you know, live and learn. But uh, yeah, there was, there was definitely a lot of drugs. <laughs> yes. Uh, Robin Roberts, finished up with the ass. Ever happened to me? He's a great picture going on. Yes, yes, he was a great pitcher. Great. Team and team and Richie Yeah. <laughs> yes. That was a good time. 
your tenure there was also a good time for the Flyers. Did you ever go to? Did you go to a lot of Flyer games? Did you have I, a favorite Flyer? I, I dated Jimmy Watson. Oh, number twenty. Enough said. <laughs> <laughs> I dated. That was my father's other big moment. Maybe <laughs> I dated one of the Stanley Cup champions. Really fly bachelor, the only bachelor on the team. Number twenty, Jimmy Watson. And <laughs> slower than his brother Joe. Yes, yeah. Joe Watson. Great guy, Joe Watson. Great guy, Jimmy. A little shy. Nice guy. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you, Arlene. And again, uh, copies of her book. You can read all the juicy stuff that she didn't talk to us about. Um, all right. So now we uh, very quickly we have a presentation from uh, Ira, uh, who's from the Roger Hornsby's chapter. We're going to talk about Sabres and the baseball memories program. He wants to start a uh, chapter here in Houston. Um, but uh, before he gets started, there's a little three-minute video he wants everybody to see. So uh, um, after the video, just I have Ira talk for a few minutes about baseball and it's it's great program. For a second. All right. Okay. Sports has a unique way of bringing people together. It connects generations with shared experiences of our youth. And for those living with dementia, it has a profound power to trigger memories of the past. That power is being unleashed through innovative sports reminiscence programs created by members of SABRE, the Society for American Baseball Research. Saber has been on the leading edge of baseball reminiscence programs with the goal of enhancing the quality of life for people with dementia, chronic health issues, or living in social isolation. Since 2015, we've partnered with Alzheimer's Texas, Alzheimer's Los Angeles, and the Veterans Administration to present over 200 sessions of engaging and interactive experiences for people living with dementia and their care partners. Our sessions range from bringing up to share stories, trivia quizzes, discussions on baseball history, going to ball games together, even taking batting practice with plastic balls and bats. The Sabre supports baseball memories groups in Westchester County, New York, Cleveland, Central Texas, Los Angeles, and San Diego, and we're just getting started. In addition to supporting new programs in safer regions around the country, our Baseball Memories Community of Interest is producing a promotional study about the value of these sessions and a research study sharing an analysis of the impact of Sabre's programs. Watching what happens here is like watching people come to life. I saw Richard in my own eyes, the sparkle, the happiness, the smile. It feels like we're having an extended family there. How these amazing members welcome us. I look forward to it every week to go there because everything was positive and talking about baseball. Sabre offers these programs at no cost to local and regional organizations, senior communities, and resource centers. 
we are inviting partners and sponsors to join us in this remarkable community outreach to connect with people in memory care and spread joy for friendship, camaraderie, and our national pastime. Join us. For more information, visit saberbaseballmemories.org. First thing I want to do is start off by saying thanks for having me, and, and it means a lot that you would have me here today to talk about Charlie Murphy, the kind of classic showman behind the Chicago Cubs. And one of the things that excites me most about being here is the opportunity to share with you a little bit about someone from the dead ball era who is not particularly well. Better make sure we ready? You ready? Yeah, we're ready. <laughs> All right. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Sorry about that. Uh, Okay. Uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you, uh, the entire Durker chapter. And one of the things I noticed, I, didn't, I, I noticed in just seeing that clip, which I've seen before, is there was a quick picture of, uh, he may have been in more than one picture because he was, he was uh, one of the volunteers for a while at the very start. Uh, starting your chapter and started our chapter was Bill Gilbert, and uh, he was a great guy. Uh, anyway, uh, I guess a little bit about my experience first, which follows that of basically, you know, certainly all the volunteers in Austin, and I imagine all the volunteers in the different cities that we've got this program, which is, it's fulfilling, it's an awful lot of fun for us, and we, we, know, it, we know it's helpful, we know it's helping them. Uh, I've been with the group, with the Hornsby chapter uh, baseball memories group since uh, Jim Kenton started it in 2015. And uh, originally pre COVID, we basically took the summer off and the other three seasons, we met for an hour and a half, we met from 11 to 1230. And uh, we, we had lunch from about 12 to 1215. And so it was on a nice regular schedule for them. And uh, we met, we did it uh, 18 times a year. We did it uh, every other week for uh, over a 12 week period, which was six times. And we had basically three seasons of the, of the four going. The last, uh, since COVID, we've been doing it by Zoom and we've basically been meeting for an hour uh, every, every other week, basically. And uh, in 2020, the, the Sabre Board basically endorsed the uh, baseball reminiscence charted community. And uh, the objective, uh, more or less, is uh, to basically to have us uh, start programs, start more programs that enhance the uh, quality of life for people with Alzheimer's, dementia, or suffering from either loneliness and or isolation. And uh, I've been I've been assisting the national leadership in, in doing this, which is why I'm I'm speaking with with, with you today. And uh, uh, there's a, if anybody is a bit more interested, let me just mention this three minute video that you saw on the website, which is uh, it's an easy website to remember. It's uh, saberbaseballmemories.org. There's a uh, there's about a 23 minute version. Of, of that same video that gets into you know a little bit more depth and more depth that I'll get into today. Uh, as a group, just to get into our meetings a bit, uh, we always start with the singing of Take Me Out to the Ball Game, whether it was in person or on the Zoom. Uh, we do This Day in History, where we talk about basically usually non ball baseball player, famous people's birthdays. Uh, we also talk about quite often the number one song, which uh, on, on that particular day, yes, many times it's the Beatles. Uh, we've played baseball bingo. And one time, again, it's a lot of fun. One time somebody brought in a can of mud. Yes, the mud that they rub baseballs with. Uh, we try to engage them about anything that can get them talking. And uh, uh, for example, some of the presentations, usually about 10 max 15, but 10 minutes is usually better for attention spans. I mean, I've spoken about uh, uh, New York City sitcoms, which is non-baseball, bringing up things like, you know, the Honeymooners and the Dick Van Dyke show. And, uh, you know, we show videos and, and pictures to, to supplement them. Uh, uh, I took a couple of baseball tours in the early 90s where I was on a bus for maybe uh, 10 days and went to seven or eight stadiums. I took two of those. 
uh, six years ago, I, seven, me and myself and six other friends who I grew up with in New York uh, met at the Hall of Fame. Uh, was kind of, that, was, that was an easy presentation to make. I did a quickie on the 500 home, home run hitters and you know, isolated on about seven or eight, the Ted Williams and the Willie Mazes and the Mickey Mantles, you know, the, the, the familiar names, even if you're not a baseball fan, as some of the caregivers cert certainly aren't. Uh, I mean, as far as their, this is great for their self-esteem, the camaraderie, the mental stim stimulation, they smile, they dance. You know, we've had, uh, we've had them do the twist about basically not in Zoom. I haven't seen the twist on Zoom yet, but all the, every year the live meeting, uh, we, we get them dancing and uh, it's a big break. It's a big break for their caregivers because it's uh, it's kind of an easy, relaxing, fun day as opposed to having to basically do everything for them for them. Uh, as far as getting one of these programs started, the key is basically to have uh, in what in each particular city a very motivated team leader, somebody who really wants to get one of these going as, uh, as, as Jim Kenton certainly, you know, certainly has, has done in Austin for us. And, uh, you know, John Lewandakis, who's the, who's the head of the national program here, uh, but he's, he also runs the program in Los Angeles, you know, very, very, very motivated individuals. So, I mean, that's, that's the starting point. Somebody's got to be, whether it's uh, because they've got a family member who suffered or, from it or, or it's just something that, that they, they want to do. Uh, that, that's number one. Number two, the hard part then is finding a local partner organization. Uh, and that could also be the uh, facilitator where you have your meetings when you're live. I'm talking about a local Alzheimer's group, uh, maybe a, a senior citizen center, uh, local ARP group, uh, the VA, a nursing home. Uh, we've had, when we were live, we had most of our meetings were in, uh, were in, uh, uh, too high. They have the most high-end nursing, uh, uh, you know, nursing facilities in Austin. We were in one for a year, and we were in another one uh, for I don't know, maybe about four, four different, four different years. And uh, they also, you know, they provided hot dogs and or, or, or sometimes other lunches. But hot dogs are always a very good lunch for a baseball meeting. Uh, the the caregiver. After that, uh, it's. The thing that you need, and again, the the local uh, the local partner uh, can usually assist in this is getting the participants uh, to be in the program and their caregivers, and the caregivers are really key here. I mean, they're the uh, they're the memory keepers for the couple, and you know the old elbow in the ribs, uh, you know, something comes up from, you know, 15 or 45 years ago, whether it's a, a player who, who their spouse met, or it's a city they lived in, uh, they'll get them talking. Along those lines, it helps to get to know them. Uh, right now, we've got a couple that lived in Cincinnati. We can talk about, you know, the red, big red machine, Johnny Bench, Pete Rose. Uh, we've got uh, another one who is a college catcher, uh, which kind of works. One of our volunteers was, was, was a college catcher. Uh, they joke about the tools of ignorance. Uh, again, it, it doesn't have to be baseball. Baseball is a lead in. One of our uh, participants who passed away at 91 or 92 about a year ago was a huge UT football fan. And uh, I mean, whether they're into Rice baseball or the University of, of Houston, uh, basketball program. I mean, whatever, whatever it is, again, because we get into old TV shows and music and, and, and all of that. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, you know, those are the big things, you know, somebody very motivated, a, a, a local partner, and then getting the uh, participants and caregivers. The last thing down the line would be getting people like, you know, like me, the volunteers. Sometimes apparently that's easy and sometimes it's tough, but uh, that's kind of the last thing in the chain. And the recommendation apparently is like one volunteer, especially when you're a lot live session, one volunteer per couple. And that way, like when we were live, I 
uh, I'm from New York. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a Yankee fan. And one of the guy's favorite players is Mickey Mantle. So I used to sit, I used to sit next to him and his wife. And sometimes it was him and his granddaughter. Uh, and uh, it just, it gets, it pays to get to know them, knowing where they went to college, knowing who their favorite team is. And uh, when, when you're planning this, when somebody's planning this with the local or local partner organization, uh, there are some decisions to make. Are you going to do it virtual or are you going to do it in person or, or are you going to do it both ways? Then there's what's the season going to be? Is it going to be every, is it going to be every other day? Is it going to be every other week or rather? Is it going to be every month? What time is it? We changed from Mondays to Tuesdays for a good reason. Uh, two of the two of the couples were in a choir on Monday, so we moved them to Tuesdays. Uh, you just have to be flexible, and you know you learn as you go. As as those who have basically started these programs can tell you more than I can. Uh, the the website's excellent. The website has a twenty page playbook, which really gets into. It talks about Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, it talks about the it gets into some of the innuendos on starting a program. Uh, so there's a the playbook is a 20 pages. It's a wonderful resource. Again, Saber, uh, excuse me, say, say, SaberBaseballMemories.org, and uh, it usually takes about six months to get one of these things going. And uh, I guess if any if if you or you know anybody in the area who's interested, uh, I guess the next step could be, I could probably arrange to have them uh, be a guest on an upcoming Zoom meeting, whether it's uh, the Hornsby chapter or, or, another, or another one in the country. Uh, you know, let me know. And uh, I guess in summary, uh, you know, there was a study done by the way, uh, and the feedback that we've gotten from a quantitative study from the volunteers from the participants, from the caregivers, from the Alzheimer's Association, uh, from the places where, from the nursing homes where we've hosted it, is that uh, every, everybody thinks very highly of it. And, uh, and I, I know I said it a few times, from a volunteer perspective, it's a lot of fun. We feel like we're getting back more than we're giving, but you know, we, we know it's helping them. Uh, that's pretty much it. Any anybody got any, if anybody's got any questions, I'd be glad to field any. And thank you again. Anybody have any questions for Ira? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that um, sometimes you meet at a nursing facility or nursing nursing home. Do they what? Do they normally welcome? Uh, uh, Guests that don't just reside there, like traveling yes. there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Ab ab absolutely. They're just uh, you know we we had. I mean, if you're familiar with Austin, we've the, the last we were at Westminster for a number of years, and we were at uh, Corencia for either a year or certainly part of a year, maybe a whole year at Corencia, and uh, yeah, I don't think anybody came from Corencia, and. Uh, we had one or maybe two participants who who basically came in from Westminster, but for the most part, uh, they didn't come directly from the facilities. Either right. uh, Texas Alzheimer's found them, or maybe through word of mouth from some, you know, from another participant or the, the, the caregiver. Good question. Anybody else? Well, Ira, it's a great program, and I've uh, I've gone to the winter meetings at uh, Roger Hornsby, and I always like hearing about this program. And you know, people remember one thing throughout their entire lives: it's baseball. I I, I would say I think Bob Costas said something about that a long time, didn't he? Um, but it's a great it's a great program. Thank you, Ira. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I, I'll let you know. Thanks. Yeah. All right, um, here's the thing. We have a trivia contest. That's the last thing we got to do. Um, but before we go, I just want to give you all uh, what's on tap for next month. All right. Uh, David Krell, uh, who, uh, Bob, was he the guy that threw out the first pitch 
at our absolutely she had the high bid i'm calling out the first page at saber 44. that's right he wrote a book about 1962 baseball and the uh, baseball in the time of jfk and i invited him to talk with the group next month since it is the 60 year anniversary of the franchise to talk about his book from a houston perspective all right to talk about houston baseball too so we will be honored to be joined by david krell next month july 18th I believe um also our uh president emeritus bob if you missed Saber Day in America in February, Bob told a great story about his time as a coach back in the 60s, right? Isn't that what you said? Back in the dark ages, as he said. Um, he has a few really good stories about a, probably a couple of people you've heard of that he coached, somebody very famous, and he's going to share that story. Um, I'm not going to tell you who it is. But all I'll have to say, I'll give you a hint. All right. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> all right. You, you just stay tuned. All right. Uh, if you have a story, uh, if this, aren't they doing play ball all, all summer to, uh, in, in Major League Baseball? Isn't there a program they're, they're trying to get more little league kids or something? They're doing a play ball weekend, play ball weekend or something like that this year? What's that? We just had it. Just had it? Okay, so if you have a little league story or something like that you'd like to share, you know, hey, uh, feel free to next week or next month. So uh, that's it. We're going to do the trivia contest. And Vince is not here, so I'm going to run the trivia contest. <laughs> I have the answers. Um, Vince is in Florida or something right now, so he had a dinner. Um, go, Yeah, he was here. So, um. Just sort of go through the questions. I, I have a, uh, I wrote them out. And 10 questions. Of so. Well, I'll get John Lloyd here for this. Uh, so, hey, John. Yeah, I uh, decided to make a two hour trip down here. <laughs> so these questions, um, as you know, if you know Vince, He's always wearing the Brewers cap. So this is a Houston Astros, Milwaukee Brewers connection quiz. So here we go. So oh, it's going to move his own bed. Well, he's going back there, Chris. <laughs> fast? Too fast. Yeah, let me try. You know the answer? I'm going to start turning on. You just yeah. Here we go. Which former Astros infielder and manager was also the all time winningest manager in? <laughs> <laughs> I can't read that for <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's uh, okay, yeah, how about I do that? All right, I got it. You got it? Yes, I can get back up. Let's see if this moves. All time winning this manager in Brewers franchise history until being displaced by Craig Council within just the past week. Yeah. What's that? I thought Milwaukee was doing a lot better than Brad. 
Ready for the second one? Uh, I don't know. Are we ready for the second one? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Which member of the Brewers Wall of Honor and Walk of Fame was also a manager for the Astros? Uh, Maxwell, you getting all these? Yep. Y'all ready for the third question? Okay. One player who has his number retired by the Astros ended his big league career with the Brewers in Milwaukee. Who is it? Good question. Well, Vince is not here, so if there's a question, question I have. <laughs> We ready for the next one? Okay. Brewers won the AL pennant 82 and did so at least partially because of the 329 ERA posted down the stretch from this pitcher acquired from Houston at that year's trade deadline. Name that pitcher. Bonus, name the three players the Astros received back in the deal. Like I said, it was four points for that question. No. Next question. Which former Bruce pitcher and St. Houston State University alum is now a color analyst for Astros broadcasts? The layup right there. <laughs> Which broadcast? Radio or TV? Well, uh, okay. English or Spanish? I'll give you that. <laughs> Astros were contenders, and the Brewers were not contending for much of anything. The teams made a big trade during the 2015 season. The two players acquired by Houston did play several years with the Astros, and all four players acquired by the Brewers played at the big league level for Milwaukee, including the current reigning NL reliever of the year. To one point each, named the six players involved in the deal. Are we ready? We can always go back if you guys need to. Yeah, we can go back. Two current Astros or former Brewers, name them. One point each. Eighth inning. One current Astros star and 2021 All-Star was originally drafted by Milwaukee, but never played for the Brewers. Instead, while he was playing in AAA in 2008, Milwaukee traded him to Cleveland as part of the Sabathia, trip, Sabathia deal. Who is it? And finally, which Houston Astro led the AL in offensive strikeouts in 2013 with 212, then managed to lead the NL in the same category in 2016 with 206. He has it down here. There should be a total of 18 answers. When you need a question, bring it back. Last one would be a right? All right, got them all good. I ripped them all. Okay, what? Last one. Big picture or battle? Offensive. Offensive strike. Offensive strike. Online, are y'all ready? 
Y'all need any questions right back? Anybody left? Hey, Maxwell. Hey, Maxwell Martian. Maxwell Martian. Carl. Should be 18 answers. All right. So number one. I'm not going to read the question again. Okay. Answer would be Phil Garner. Question two. Cecil Cooper. Question three. Great Jimmy Wynn. Oh. <laughs> Question four. Two parts. First part, Don Sutton. Bonus, Kevin Bats. Frank DePino. Mike Madden. Question five, Steve Sparks. What? Steve Sparks. That's Question six, everybody's buddy in Houston, Mike Fires. <laughs> <laughs> we should not come talk to our chef. Yeah, we should invite Mike Fires to talk to us. Carlos Gomez, Brett Phillips, Domingo Santana, Adrian Hauser, and Josh Hader. Still can't believe we let him go. Number seven. Mauricio Dubon, Martin Maldonado. He put Mickey Brantley, number eight. Michael Brantley. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Brantley, wow. Okay. Final question, Chris Carter. Strikeout machine, yes, it was. Okay, so 18 possible answers. 10? Anybody get 10? Nobody got 10? Yeah. Maxwell, you get 10? Four points. Seven. Maxwell, you got seven? Seven. Anybody more than seven? <laughs> Maxwell, you won. <laughs> wow congratulations Maxwell you get the right to trivia for next and that was with screwing up on the Jimmy Wynn question too <laughs> next month when's the meeting next month July 18th I'll be in England you'll be in England yes sir well you can uh you know Email us the questions. Maybe six and, hours ahead of us. Just turn yeah. on at midnight. Yeah, we'll six hours. You can handle that. <laughs> you know, one o'clock in the morning. Why not? Hey, be like Kramer behind you. You can handle it, right? Arlene just told you how to stay up all night. Hey. <laughs> Arlene, you have a comment? I, I wanted to add a picture of it. And him to add to my baseball player. And my photos. So we'll, we'll come back next month. And you're gonna go for that. Thank you all. It was great. July 18th. Maxwell works. We'll work some out with it. All right. Bye. 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 B